Okay, very good afternoon. In today's session, we are going to discuss some of the short stories uh, written by Devdatta Patnayak in his book, She Can D and other queer tales they don't tell you. Now, as far as this particular book is concerned, it is divided into uh, two parts. Uh, part one is about appreciating queerness and the discovery or invention of queerness. So it's around uh, 36 pages. Uh, which is followed by part two, and the book consists of 30 mythological stories. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all know the character Shikandi, which is from Mahabharata. So the first story is, uh, is about Shikandi, and that's why the book is titled as uh, Shikandi, and other queer tales they don't tell you. Uh, we'll discuss three stories, uh, first three stories, and uh, these all are mythological stories, and the writer uh, doesn't intend to harm our feelings and emotions because these all are related to our religion. Uh, in the first part, uh, the writer expresses that the queer stories are not only restricted to Hindu mythology, but uh, we find uh, queer stories in other regions as well. So we have uh, stories from Arctic regions. Uh, we have stories from Aztec mythology. We have uh, stories from Cuban Santeria mythology. And we have stories from uh, Viking mythology as well as Egyptian mythology. And they all talk about uh, queerness. Uh, we are not going to talk about uh, these uh, mythological uh, details but uh, we'll focus mainly on uh, mythological stories which uh, talk about queerness in Hindu mythology. Then we have uh, Persian mythology, we have uh, uh, biblical mythology, where also we have references to queerness. Uh, we also have Jain traditions as well, where we find uh, references to queerness. So let's uh, quickly look at the first story, uh, Shikhandi who became a man to satisfy her wife. I don't know uh, whether you know the story of Shikhandi, uh, which is from uh, Mahabharata. Now again, a good thing about this particular book is that uh, all the stories are very short. So we can actually read the entire story because uh, the first story is around five or six pages, but the other two stories mm -hmm. which we are going to discuss today run into a page or two. And it is followed by uh, some comments uh, which are by the writer. Uh, now, Sikhandi is a character uh, in Mahabharata. And uh, I'm sure uh, you all know that uh, there was war between Kauravas and Pandavas. And uh, many uh, kings supported Pandavas and many supported uh, Kauravas. 
and uh, it was ferocious uh, war and uh, Bhishma was unbeatable. So almost for first nine days, uh, nobody could defeat Bhishma. And uh, it was at that time, Shikhandi decided, decided to fight against Bhishma because Bhishma had taken an oath that he would fight only against men in the war. And Shikhandi was neither a man nor a woman. And when Shikhandi uh, decided to fight against Kauravaj, Bhishma decided to put down his weapons. So this is the story I'm sure that you all are aware of. But uh, let's talk about uh, Shikhandi's married life when he decided, or rather, when he became a man to fulfill the desires of his wife. There was once a princess called Amba who wanted to marry a man called Shalva. But on the day uh, she was to select him as her husband, a warrior called Bhishma abducted her and her sisters and took them to his city of Hastinapur, where they were told they would have to marry his much younger and far less competent half-brother, Vichitravirya. So this is the background uh, and uh, this is about Amba. Amba begged that she be allowed to marry the man of her choice and Vichitravirya let her go. As the idea of having to satisfy two wives was stressful enough. Unfortunately for Amba, Shalva refused to accept her as his wife as she had been tainted touched by another man. So Amba returned to Vichitravirya. He too refused to accept her as a gift given away. He said cannot be taken back. Amba then went to Bhishma and begged him to marry her. He said he could not as he had taken the woe of celibacy. Go back to your father, he said or stay in the palace as a maid. The furious Amba prayed to Kartikeya, god of war, killer of men, who gave her a garland of ever fresh lotuses. Anyone, anyone who accepted this garland would kill Bhishma. Unfortunately, no man on earth accepted it, celestial grace notwithstanding. When even Drupad, powerful king of Panchala, turned his back on her, a prostrated Amba flung the garland and it landed up hanging from a pillar in Drupad's palace. Amba then approached Parshuram, a sage who was an expert in the martial arts and who was renowned for his hatred of warriors. She requested him to be her champion and punish Bhishma, who had ruined her life. Parshuram tried but failed. His woe of celibacy has granted him the power to choose, the, to choose the time of his death. I cannot defeat him, he said. A desperate Amba invoked Shiva, the destroyer. Shiva appeared, pleased with her intense austerities and said rather cryptically that she would be the cause of Bhishma's death 
but only in her next life. To hasten her next life, Amba leapt into the fire and died. So she committed suicide by uh, throwing herself into the into the fire. She was reborn as Drupad's daughter. But Drupad wanted a son and had been promised one by Shiva. Convinced that Shiva would not lie to him, Drupad claimed his daughter was actually his son and ordered her to be raised as one. The girl named Shikhandi was taught all the skills reserved for men. She grew up believing she was a warrior. She even she was even given a wife. But on the wedding night, when the bride discovered that her husband was a woman, Shikhandi, not Shikhandi, she ran to her father in a state of shock. Determined to avenge this insult, the bride's father, King Hiranyavarna of Dasarana, raised an army and threatened to invade Panchal. Drupad knew that the only way to save his kingdom was to prove that his son was truly a man. He also knew that this was impossible. Confronted with her Femininity for the first time in her life, she can be felt responsible for this calamity. Resolving to kill herself, she went to the forest. But a yaksha called Stuna saved her. Was it a woman he saved or a man? For the girl thought like a man and felt like a man and had always been treated as a man. But that body of hers was certainly not a man's. On hearing Shikhandi's story, uh, Stuna lent her his manhood for one night. Thus equipped, Shikhandi could prove his masculinity to anyone who cared to test it. Hiranyavarna sent his courtesans, who sent back a satisfactory report. Concluding that his daughter had made a mistake, Hiranyavarna apologized to Drupad and sent his daughter back. Shikhandi then performed his husbandly duties to the satisfaction of his newly wedded wife. Kube, king of Yakshas, was very angry with Stuna for lending out his manhood. Such things are not to be done, but when Shikhandi true to his promise, came to the Yaksha to return the borrowed organ. Kubera was so pleased with his integrity that he allowed Shikhandi use of the Yaksha's manhood as long as he lived. It would return to Stuna only after Shikhandi died. Durupad was happy to finally get a son, but then to his dismay, Shikhandi, in a rather cavalier moment, uh, placed around his neck Amba's garland of ever fresh lotus flower that for years had been hanging on a pillar of its palace. He will kill Bhishma, mourned Drupad. But I need a son who will kill Dron. Dron was the teacher of the Kuru princess. And the Kuru princes were Vichitravirya's grandsons. They included the five Pandavas, sons of Pandu, and the hundred Kauravas, the sons of Dhritarashtra. Bhishma had asked Drona to tutor the Kuru princes. And as tuition fee, Drona had asked the Kuru princes to give him one half of Panchal. Accordingly, after a period of intense training, the boys had invaded Drupad's kingdom and claimed half of it for his teacher. Drupad wanted a son who would kill Drone and a daughter who would divide the Kuru household that had supported Drone. 
Shri Gandhi could be neither one nor the other. He was useless. So Drupad conducted a yagya that would give him the children he wanted. The fire yielded Draupadi, the perfect woman, and Drushandyam, the perfect man. Draupadi became the common wife of the five Pandava brothers who demanded a kingdom of their own as the hundred Kauravas refused to share Hastinapur with them. Bhishma gave them the forest of Khandavprast on which they built the very impressive city of Indraprast, rivaling the old city of Hastinapur. Thus did Drupad's daughter fulfill her father's wish. The jealous Kaurava invited the Pandavas to a game of dice during which the Pandavas were lured into wagering their kingdom. Foolishly, they gambled and lost their kingdom. Control over it could only be regained after 13 years of forest exile. When the Pandavas returned from exile, the Kauravas refused to return even a little point of Indraprastha. The only way to get back what was theirs was by declaring war. Drupad offered his army led by Drushandyam to his sons-in-law. Knowing well that Drona would join the Kaurava side, giving his son the chance to fulfill his wish. Unfortunately, the war between the Pandavas and Kauravas reached no conclusion despite nine days of fighting. Bhishma led the Kaurava forces. Though old, he was still a formidable force in battle. As long as I hold the bow, my children no arrow will get past me. Besides, no one can kill me as I can choose the time of my death, declared Bhishma. This was the clue Krishna was looking for. Krishna, cousin of the Pandavas and the friend of Draupadi said, he cannot be killed, but he can be pinned to the ground by arrows. For that, we have to get him to lower his bow. He will lower his bow not before a man, but certainly before a woman. But how do we get a woman into the battlefield? That is not permitted by law. Drupad then offered the eldest child, Shikhandi, who was born a woman and had become a man. Bhishma will see him as a woman, but we will contest his view. For now he is a man with a wife who no longer doubts his masculinity. On the 10th day, Shikhandi rode into the battle on Krishna's chariot. Behind him was Arjun, the third Pandava, greatest archer in the world. Sure enough, Bhishma refused to raise his bow against him, declaring, born a woman, you're always a woman. Taking advantage of this, Arjun released a volley of arrows and pinned the old man to the ground. Following this incident, Drun was made commander of the Kaurava armies. He managed to kill Drupad. Rishandum avenged his father's death and fulfilled his destiny by eventually beheading Drone, something no one dared to do as Drone was a Brahmin. Eventually, all the Kauravas were killed and the kingdoms of Hastinapur and Indraprastha came under Pandava control. But it was no happy ending. On the night of victory, victory Drone's son attacked the Pandava camp when all the soldiers were sleeping and killed everyone there. Draupadi's sons were beheaded. Her twin brother, Drishandum, was strangulated and the elder brother, Shikhandi was found split in two. So uh, this is the story which is about Shikhandi, who is actually the main cause uh, for Bhishma to put down his bow or to, to put down his weapons. And this gave an opportunity to Pandavas to attack the Kauravas. Now, if you look at the character of Shikhandini, uh, if we try to evaluate you know, from queer point of view, 
the modern uh, supporters of queer theory uh, believe that Shikandini became Shikandi. So it was a uh, change in gender from female to male. And uh, even though it's a change in gender in modern terminology, Bhishma did, did not look at Shikandi, Shikandi as Shikandi, but looked at as Shikandini. And he said that a woman who is born woman remains woman forever. So this is something about um, the difference between Hindu mythology uh, in the past and the approach of queer terrorist today. And uh, when we look at uh, Shikhandi as the change in gender, uh, you know, the reality is that the patriarchal society in India uh, would always, would always uh, think that he was neither a, neither a man nor nor a woman. Just a minute. So uh, that's the difference between that's the difference between uh, queer terrorist and uh, patriarchal approach towards uh, Hindu mythology. Now, uh, the role of Shikhandi is very important. Uh, and if we try to evaluate the entire war, uh, we will realize that his arrival can be seen as the turning point of the war. Because Bhishma uh, died uh, in the midpoint of the 18th day of war. So first nine days, uh, Bhishma fought against the Pandavas and they were unable to crack Bhishma and attack on Kauravat. But it was only when Shikhandi who entered into war the entire scene changed. Now, if you look at the actual meaning of the word Shikhandi, you will come to know the word Shikhandi means one who has tufted hair like a peacock. And uh, it is one of the names of God and so part of the list of a thousand names of Shiva and Vishnu. So the name is also symbolic. Now, a modern uh, queer theorist uh, talk about uh, the conflict which has been created by Vyas between the sexual Amba or Srikandi and the asexual Bhishma, who has taken the woe of celibacy. Bhishma's celibacy grants him long life. Uh, his contact with the sexual being leads to his death. This reinforces the traditional association of sex with mortality, materiality, and the mundane, and celibacy with immortality and the transcendental.
Now, another question which is raised by the writer in his comments is that till date, no author has it explored the relationship of Draupadi, the complete woman, and Drushandyum, the complete man, with Shrikanji, who is neither a complete woman nor a complete man. Nobody talks about who will inherit Drupad's throne, the elder Shikandi or the younger Drushandyum. And what about Shikandi's relationship with his wife? How does it feel to know that your husband was a woman on the wedding night and then is a man in the following night sporting someone else's genitalia? So this is a question <clears throat> which is raised by a writer. Now, uh, finally, the writer also talks about uh, Bhishma. Uh, Devrat uh, was his real name, and he was renamed Bhishma, uh, which is, uh, which literally means the fierce one, because he chose to remain celibate so that his old father could remarry. <clears throat> this meant he could never father a son, that is Putra, or daughter, that is Putri, and so faced eternal entrapment in a hell-like realm, that is Put, unable to be reborn for having failed to repay his debt to his ancestors, that is Pitra. Today, childless couples and single people are advised to offer prayers in places such as Gaya in Bihar to placate their ancestors to ensure their own rebirth. So uh, this is something the writer comments on this particular story. Uh, I'm sure that uh, <clears throat> you have understood the first story. Any doubts? No, sir. OK. No, sir. Uh, yeah, let's look at the second story, which is uh, only a page story. Uh, it is titled as uh, Mahadeva, who became a woman to deliver his devoted child. Now, this has been adopted from uh, Tamil temple lore. So we have many folklores. So this is uh, adopted from Tamil temple lore. The river Kaveri was in spate. Dark clouds covered the sky. The sound of thunder was deepening. The rains were incessant. No boatman was willing to risk his life or his boat. A mother realized she would not be able to reach her daughter's house in time for the delivery of her grandchild. What should I do now? She waited. What can we do but pray to Shiva, who is Mahadev, greater than all the Devas? Only he can help, said her husband. The prayers reached mountain Kailas, and so moved was Shiva by the plight of his devotees that he decided to deliver the child himself. But she will be frightened when you approach her as you are, said Shiva's wife, Gauri. Look at yourself. You are smeared with ash. Your hair is matted and you have a garland of skulls around your neck. So Shiva took the form of the old mother and went to the daughter's house. She comforted her with songs and held her hands and wiped her sweat until the baby slipped out. He then placed the baby on the mother's breast and cleaned the room and lit the lamps as a midwife is supposed to. When the mother finally arrived, the daughter saw two mothers and wondered who was the real one and who was the imposter. The imposter smiled and disappeared, and the daughter realized 
she was none other than Shiva. So this is a very short story where uh, Lord Shiva, who is a male member, adopted the role of a woman, old woman, so that the devotee's uh, child gives birth and there is a helping hand. She doesn't wait for her mother to come. And you know, if you visit Triti, uh, there is a temple called Rockford, and uh, you will find the shrine of Shiva Mahadev, who served as midwife. And the deity is called Thayumana Swami the Lord who took the form of a mother. This story is part of Tamil Bhakti tradition that dates back to at least 50 century and even earlier, according to traditional beliefs. While Vedic idea spread in India from north to south, in all probability, Bhakti idea spread from south to north. Uh, in some versions of the story, Shiva is assisted by Gauri and Ganga, his two wives in the southern tradition. Even though his wives are women, quite capable of handling the delivery, he insists on becoming women for his devotee. In devotional literature, gods take female forms all the time sometimes to serve as go-betweens to bring lovers together, sometimes to stand in for a missing wife or to do the household chores, sometimes to nurse a sick devotee. These queer stories are not sexual, but they do challenge notions of gender. This queering is is unique to India's devotional tradition. In other devotional traditions, God tends to be predominantly masculine and distant. The emotion is one of submission, not affection. Basavanna, I'm sure you all must have heard the name of Basavanna, who is a 12th century Kannada mystic, poet and devotee, says, I wear these clothes only for you, sometimes man, sometimes woman. I make wars for you, O Lord of the meeting rivers, and will even be your devotee's bride. Thus gender makes no sense in the world of devotion. Queer vocabulary helps break the fixed structures of humanity and flow into divinity. <laughs> 